Welcome to Chris Parkin Shooting Sports. Today we've got a new thermal imager. This is the PARD TA62 and this one's got the 35mm focal length lens on it which gives a base level 2.8 times magnification which can then be digitally zoomed 2, 4 or 8 times. The sensor itself is a 12 micron sensor and it's 640 by 480 pixels. Now I could go to the ends of the earth telling you all the specifications and I'll maybe do that towards the end but there will be a link on this so you can go to them and find them in huge detail if you want them. But that's projecting through to 1024 by 768 pixel display screen at the back end. So <laughs> specifications are all very nice but What's the real world like of using this thing? Well, essentially, this is a handheld unit, and let's go through it. So the button at the front, switch it on, hold that down for three seconds, it turns on, it takes about five seconds before the whole thing lights up in total. If you want to turn it off completely, hold the front button down, it switches off. If you want to turn it off briefly to you know, take the illumination off, you can just press the button quickly and the screen turns off so you're not shining light upon your own face. Looking at the features, okay, number one, it's got an 18650 flat top battery in it and that goes in the back there. I do like that because you can have spares of these and you can swap them that quickly and okay, it's very nice being able to plug things in on USB-C and power things additionally, but I don't think there's anything any quicker than that. You do get a USB-C cable with it and in the front, the USB-C cable pokes in there to charge it all up. There's also an SD card there for all your data that you want to record on it, an HDMI out port. Now, whether you're going to use those or not, I don't know, that's up to you. I do like the fact you can separate the battery and of course the SD card, it just makes living with it easier and you can keep everything on charge more easily without actually having to have the whole unit plugged in and spares quickly to swap over. So when we switch it on, essentially you've got image focus on the screen at the back and that goes from plus five to minus five diopter, so it's great for your eye. More about this in a minute. The front end focus is there, which is your image focus changed for distance in the field. Now there's a rubber bellows eye cup on the back and oh, just a little bit more though first. Grip on the focal control eyepiece at the back is excellent, so you can get a really nice crisp image to suit your eyesight. Image focusing is handled at the front on the objective lens here. There's no backlash and it's quite easy to focus in quickly. It's grippy wearing gloves or with bare fingers and there's actually plenty of space to get hold of it. The buttons on the top, you've basically got zoom in, zoom out, and then that's the menu function. We'll go through those in a minute. But what I really, 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 really want to tell you is that everybody wants to go on about what's the best resolution sensor, what's the best resolution screen, what's the best resolution video, and what so many people forget is this glass lens in the back here and call me Mr Picky but that's the first thing I notice on this kind of tool because that's got 15 millimeters of eye relief and you've got a nice rubber eye cup there so this is an ambidextrous unit you can use either hand to either side but the point is that lens is extremely well ground so you aren't finding and searching for a tiny little field you know, pinprick focal point, and if you move even slightly, you lose it. You know, messing around with focusing this, that, and the other. That doesn't happen on this tool. You focus it once to get a nice crisp resolution on the internal display, and then you're done. And I have to say, that is a groundbreaker for me, because there are plenty of units out there now that have good ocular lenses. I think this as an ocular lens is one of the best I've seen, especially at this price point. But don't get too tied up on footage quality when you don't think about the usability factor. And that alone is one of the biggest usability factors for me overall. I found this fox casually waiting for me one evening just beyond my shooting bench on my normal 100m test range. Sadly for the fox on this evening, the rifle had already been tested and it was ready zeroed with a PAR DS35 on it. So I did say this unit is ambidextrous. Now it comes with, in the box, you've got a nice cloth carry case to put in. It's also got a lateral hand strap. If you want to put a hand strap on the side of it, which I took off and put back in the box. So that goes on the side and goes around the back of your palm if you want to have it like that. You also get a neck strap with it, which is my preference because I can just pop it over my neck and it's there and I can swap to either hand just as quickly. 
I like monoculars because I like to share the footage on both eyes, partly because that's a bright screen, you're in the darkness, and if I share it between the two, night vision is something you naturally start to lose when you're exposed to bright light. So I can share the loss between the eyes and I don't have as much balance issue without one eye losing out and being dark all the time. What else can I tell you about this? Well, the buttons are rubberized, they're tactile, and you can feel them, even through gloves. There's just enough space between them, but you can fit them under your four fingers like that and operate them. So I'll go through some of the screens that it offers you now. So we've switched it on, hold down the front one, three seconds and it's turned on. I can see the PAR logo and now it's ready, it's lit up. So what can I tell you? Top left corner is telling me what mode it's in. Top right corner tells me which colour palette I'm in and I'm white hot at the moment. Bottom left says the Wi-Fi switched off and the bottom right says the battery's at full capacity. He can see the red hotspot finder dancing around the screen looking for the hottest spot. I'm also scrolling through the colour palettes of white hot, black hot, red hot and fusion. There is also an outline mode which gives you a very binary image. So as I say going through the buttons, the front one is power. That's up or zoom on the menus, that's down or zoom on the menus and there's the screen and that's the menu button itself. So if I press the menu button once, it brings up the menu screen instantly. It's a nice grey background menu screen, nice and clear. And again, that lovely flat focal field view is across the whole screen. So I'm not fighting and looking for things and it just makes life so much easier. So if I look at you now while I go through this menu, we've got image setting. So let's start with image setting. That gives me, 100. I'm on 105 contrast, so we've got adjustable contrast, adjustable brightness, we've got detail and sharpness as well as mode zero. I haven't gone through the entire instruction book yet and I haven't needed to because it came set up beautifully and I've just had it, I love an intuitive item and when I can just start using it without having to research it, well I think that's really, really quite indicative of the fact it's a good product to be honest. I thought the image quality was excellent at this price point. It gave me fantastic texture to allow me to see the landscape in its true format. I was easily able to see all foliage, fences and barbed wire to make sure all my shots were going to be safe. This fox is clearly cooling down now, but it's great to see the texture still available from the sub 25 millikelvin net D rating on this pard. I particularly like this clip because it shows the great contrast available from the part. You get great texture on the landscape, but that doesn't stop the fact that brighter, hotter hair pops well from the background to make sure you notice it immediately. So if I go back into the menu, if I hold it down, it'll go back to the standard menu structure. I can then go into display settings. Display settings gives me six contrast levels. I've got brightness, I've got color temperature, which obviously changes you know, the Kelvin rating of the actual temperature on the lights. Now lights like in here, you can have whiter lights or warmer lights, and those are all adjustable through this, as well as the, as well as the actual brightness of the screen itself. I'm running it on screen brightness 2 rather than up on 6 because I just don't need it that bright because I don't want to you know, lose as much night vision as possible and of course I'm using it in darkness anyway so why have it super bright? Next menu function is, we'll just hold that down, go back to the main screen. Okay, we're going to scene selection. So scene selection is city, forest or rain. That basically works through the algorithms in the actual programming and running software, the firmware itself to give you the best image quality offsetting against those factors, which of course we all experience in the field. This is a rodeo looking back over its shoulder from about 150 meters away, checking out what I'm doing as I drive past in the truck on the farm. I've only had this for about four days. I love it already. Um, it's freezing cold. So of course the thermal is gonna get a fairly easy life from that. And this is operable from minus 30 to plus 60 degrees. It does warn you not to point it at lasers or welding or at the sun, which is probably fairly obvious because that can obviously damage the sensor like any sensor can be damaged. Next setting on here, I'll go back to the menu, magnify center position. So we've got two choices really through the magnification settings. We can run normal magnification or we can run picture in picture. 
if you run normal magnification settings with picture and picture turned off, when you press up and down, it zooms the whole screen, the full rectangular width of the screen, up through one, two, four, or eight times magnification. If you turn picture in picture on, the whole centre screen stays at the standard one times magnification, which is 2.8 times optical magnification from the 35mm lens. But essentially, if you have the picture in picture with zoom, the picture in picture alone goes up through two, four, or eight times magnification. And I must admit, I really, really like that because usually I want magnification on one specific detail I'm looking at, but I do like having that remaining full width field of view to actually look over. So that's another small feature I quite like about it. These heads are dancing around. It's about 60 meters away from where I'm standing. There's a 30 hertz refresh rate and the picture is very fluid with smooth motion. So we go back here and the next thing we've got shutter correction. So you can set shutter correction on automatic or manual basically to, you know, bring the shutter over the screen and zero it effectively so you, you, it warms up over time and you do tend to get noise as it's called on these things and that's just across most products you do that. Hot tracking next feature that's a red dot it bounces around all over the screen and finds basically whatever you're looking at that is the hottest thing. Um, it does work very well I tended to find it a little bit bothersome because it's dancing all over the place all the time especially when you've got a lot of quarry spread around. There's some video of a lot of hairs on a large field the other night. Hot tracking is bouncing all over the place. It's like a little red circle boom, zooming around. Not, not my cup of tea, but it can be useful in some scenarios. Next setting here is centre marking. So centre marking basically gives you sort of like a, a, a crosshair type arrangement right in the middle of the screen. So you know if you put that crosshair on your quarry or whatever you want to focus in on detail, when you press the up button to magnify, the picture in picture is focusing exactly where that crosshair is. That is a nice feature, that's one I've left on because I find it quite usable. What's next? Auto recording, fairly simple, switch it on, it records automatically. Loop recording will then go round in zero, sorry, loop recording will go around in three, five or ten minute segments. So I tend to not use any automation like that if I want to record I'll set it recording manually because I do tend to have this on all the time and if I leave it and I just leave it hanging there it's fine. I'm not going to be out for four hours leaving it recording the whole time but certainly when I see quarry I'll just set it going and leave it going and therefore when it's up it's recording I don't really think about it. Um, so I'll just zero this back now just turn that back off. Date stamp fairly obvious do you want your footage to have a date on it um, record audio. Yes, I have recorded audio and I will say about this, it doesn't seem, it seems to record very good audio actually. Um, I've done a few night vision thermal imaging kit recently where you know you're squeaking against your fingers or something like that and the noise that gets recorded by the unit either on rifle scope or the spotter in your hand, it gets totally distorted and it sounds absolutely horrendous. This one actually seems to record quite honestly and I do like that and it doesn't seem to matter about having the caps on or off. The cap on here is basically over the uh, charging port, USB-C charging port and the SD card and the whole unit is IP67 rated. So that means it's shower proof and it will take the odd splash but do not immerse it. But I think that's fairly obvious and you know you tend to leave these things which are quite valuable tied fairly well attached to you around your neck like that makes it harder to lose it. Let's have a look at the next menu function. Next menu function, beep sound for HDMI. I don't use HDMI, I don't really want any beeps going on anyway, so that's a non-starter for me. Wi-Fi, you can run Wi-Fi, you can get your smartphone, pad do an app and you can actually run it real time through to that, gives you some of the functionality of it. It's nice if you want to use it, personally I just use things as a hunting tool as, as easily as I can because that's the most important priority for me. But different people have different priorities. Next thing, language, you've got some options there. Date, time, obviously just set it up with the local date and time. I do find it very, very useful to record date and time because if I see something and you know don't get the opportunity, you know some of the animals are shooting and hunting with thermal imaging are quite creatures of timely habit. So go back the next day 20 minutes earlier and you're ready for it. And uh, that's a handy function of the date and time stamp on these things. Gives you a record of what you've done. The next thing, format. That basically formats the memory card. I won't do that because I'll do it on my computer when I use the memory card to transfer footage. 
blank pixel compensation that's if you just get a warm spot or anything like that you can delete that pixel and you don't and then have it again um, no problems with that on this unit for me but it's something that most manufacturers do offer default settings i'm not going to go back to default settings because i've set it up how i want it although it did seem to arrive with very good settings on it all i've done is dim the screen brightness a little bit because i don't use it much in daylight firmware update I'm sure at some point firmware will come along, people will want to change it, and it also tells you the firmware version. So that's pretty much gone through the menu structure of it. What can I tell you about it in terms of handling it in the real world? Well, you've got all sorts of little slots here so you can put the, the, um, the side handle on or anything like that. I'm using it on a lanyard. There's a quarter inch UNC tripod mount on the bottom if you want to put it on a tripod. That can be kind of handy if you want to run it on a secondary display screen with the Wi-Fi, but don't forget you do get a bit more latency when you're doing that rather than having the screen in front of your eyes itself. This has got 30 frames per second refresh rate, so you do get smooth tracking on it. But you know, you notice the difference in refresh rate speeds on things, and as soon as you put a bit of latency into something, which is the time it takes that to communicate with your smart device, well, you know, you're just not quite in the real time. And, Sometimes in fast fire situations, you don't have milliseconds to spare waiting for things like that to happen. Actual field of view at 2.8 times magnification is 12 and a half degrees. And I do find that wide enough because that's, you know, base level magnification. It's what I leave things on most of the time because of course at base level, it's optical and you're not digitally zooming in. The zoom magnification on it does give me some quite good footage and I've used it on a couple of occasions. I did actually have a scenario last night where I really wanted to check something out and you'll probably see this on a later video where there were a couple of things milling around. One of them was actually on the query list. One of them was definitely on the do not engage this thing list. So that's why I wanted to be able to zoom in and really check on the detail. And actually as I was hunting, these two animals almost swapped positions. One went in, the other came out, and I could have really made a mistake. So I did appreciate having that great image capability and quality with this. I was tracking a fox as it headed behind some trees into some dead ground, and I lost view of it. But about 20 metres ahead of where it was heading for, another white hotspot appeared, and it would appear to be the farm cat that was inquiring what was going on. The fox later turned round and reappeared back where I'd seen it earlier. And I... At this point, I let the pod hang around my neck and I changed the rifle and took the shot on. Overall weight is 328 grams, overall size is 158 by 68 by 44 millimetres. It is compact, my hands aren't huge, that's how big it is, it grasps easily on either hand. You do sometimes have to just a little bit, just remind yourself which buttons you're on, but I tended to find myself most of the time on the menu button or the up and down buttons, power on, power off, occasionally that is what it does. If you hold the menu button down for a long time, that turns the video function on. Just be careful, if you press the power button to dim the screen, that does automatically stop the video function. So that's something I did accidentally a couple of times, but I soon learned not to touch the power button in use for that reason. Anything else in the box? There's nothing really in there. You do get quite a nice Cordura carry case, which is great for just slotting it in easily, put that in your shooting bag, and as soon as you get wherever you're going, take that out, wrap it around your neck. The soft case is not something I'll probably use, the USB-C charging cable, I've got those all over the place, but it's good that they supply one with it. Charging time is about four hours. Run time, I've run it at least four hours so far. But because I've got spare batteries, it doesn't really matter to me. Spare batteries are not expensive, they're quick, they're easy to change. And of course, if you can keep spare batteries in your pockets, well, keeping them warmer keeps them lasting longer. So, you know, that's the case with any battery, and especially this time of year where we're at freezing or minus temperature you actually do appreciate that more. Just pop those back in there. I'll just slot that out, pop that in there, because that's going to be living around my neck for quite some time, hopefully. I rather like it. Um, going through the menu, the menu is quite detailed. It gives you all the dimensions. It gives you all the factors about how to use it, putting batteries in and out, etc. But to be honest, most of, most of it is very, very intuitive, and I have found it phenomenally easy to use. As well as ocular lenses, I am a stickler for menu structure and I really don't like menu structures that are either overcomplicated or put critical functions 
first on the top of the list because often critical functions, especially on things like rifle scopes, critical functions you want to, you need to have to really want to dig in to find those critical functions like zero because you don't want to accidentally change them. A bit less important on a thermal monocular because you don't have things like zeroing to do with them, but it's still nice that everything's in a nice ordered sequence and easy to access, and you don't have to go into many, 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 many sub menus. They're well ordered inside themselves. In terms of image quality, I've been very happy using this, and one of the things I do like about the firmware on board is that when you're scanning, especially a very large space, and if you move into a lot of sky, well, some thermals tend to dim the whole image down because you suddenly get this very cold air in the sky and of course the whole screen goes a little bit dim so if you've got something in the bottom of your picture that's you know right at the margin of a field or on the margin of a, a skyline we it just it just vanishes this has incredibly good um, graduation of that across the screen so when you actually slide onto the sky and back onto the land and vice versa you can see things instantly as soon as they're on screen they don't get blanked out and sort of faded in like a wave they're there instantly I do really like that. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this review of the PAR TA62 and watching some of the footage with it. Now, remember, I use my thermal imaging and night vision kit to actually hunt. I don't spend hours getting camera assistance to modify the footage or stand there with a tripod very carefully focusing each time. I'm not interested in that. What I want is to set this at about 100, 150 meters, scan everywhere. And only when I've got time do I ever want to start refocusing things. And this does have very good depth of field. So if I left this focused on about 100 meters, I didn't really have any issues with it when I wanted to look in close. And if I did have time, I can then adjust it. And the great thing about that long depth of field means you don't have to do that all the time. There is a rubber lens cap, clips on the front to protect the lens. And I've just found it very handy in terms of size and shape to slot in a pocket and carry around. Well, thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment, and click the notification bell so you can see my regular uploads. The comments you make are what make me make more videos for you. So it's thank you for that because it shows your appreciation of what's going on. If you go all the way to the end of the video, there's a link to click on for your tickets for next year's British Shooting Show. And the 2023 Shooting Show at the NEC also includes car parking. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.